Thanks. So, uh, yeah, hopefully this is, is not, not very many slides, so the average length of time per slide may be higher than normal. Let's see how we go. Uh, so the basic idea is we're interested in the spread of beliefs. These could be any type of belief, but we are focusing on discrete beliefs, let's say, about questions of fact. So the beliefs you're allowed to have, really, in our model are essentially you believe that something is true or it's false, or maybe you don't know. That's it. You could imagine many more ways of doing it. You could have probabilities as beliefs, all sorts of things. But for now, we're looking at this discrete kind of model. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about where it comes from. So the obvious questions are any kind of diffusion model. When do you get, you know, you basically got three states of a node, uh, three colors, if you think about it. When do you converge to some sort of unanimity uh, as the uh, diffusion process runs of sufficiently long? And in a, in a question like this, um, it's not enough to be unanimous. Ideally, you would, in fact, unanimously have the correct answer, or at least a strong majority of people would, would be getting the correct answer. And then a more general question is, um, which models are going to explain the data? There's a huge number of models in the general area. And uh, still an interesting question to me as to how you can differentiate between them based on experimental data. We've only started a little bit here. So I'll give you an idea what we've done. Um, where it came from is that uh, the topic of belief revision is very, very well known. Uh, in philosophy, logic, computer science, people are using databases and artificial intelligence, it's important to know what do you do when you have a consistent worldview and an extra piece of information comes in, some proposition, and makes the entire set of propositions you had inconsistent. And you then have to revise that in some way by throwing out something. Uh, and there are um, axiomatic methods for doing this from the 1980s, which have been well studied. Uh, for individuals, how you would do that. And then the question that Patrick and some logician co-authors studied was, um, what do you do when everyone is connected in some kind of social network and they can influence the beliefs of others in some sense? So there, basically their model, there are two different types of, of ways of changing beliefs. You can uh, be convinced that P is true if there's sufficient evidence for it uh, among your neighbors directly, or if you happen to believe not P before that and, only a, and you don't have enough evidence to convince you of P being true, you can become undecided. Right? There are various clear rules as to how you should do that. And originally, we were interested in this model and studying it. Uh, we did some simulations and we thought maybe we could do something analytically if we dreamed a bit more. Uh, it's quite a difficult looking model. Then we decided we really had, should actually see whether it has any relevance whatsoever to the problem that we're looking at. So we decided to try a lab experiment. That's really what this is about. And that's where Valerie came in, uh, being the expert on the experimental behavioral side. So the basic picture is that we've got our computers uh, in a lab and they're all linked up according to a topology that we choose. And we chose two very different ones. Uh, one was a complete graph, right, and one was a directed thing with very different uh, node degrees, in degrees and out degrees. And of course, the subjects, the participants, don't know what network they're connected to. They just know that they have some neighbors somewhere in the room, but they don't know which is which. And we gave them five questions, one at a time. And for each question, um, they had, each one had an objectively correct answer. And they were allowed to choose one of three options. And it was to make it, you know, we made it multiple choice. One of the answers was the correct answer, one was some wrong answer, and the third was don't know. Uh, and at each iter first, everyone answers. Then, when they're all done, you get some feedback about your neighbors, and you decide to update. Well, you can, you have the opportunity to update. Right. And they had 10 iterations of each question. So the total number, you know, we, we did this in several different sittings because of the size of the room, but we ended up with something over 50 participants, um, five questions, 10 iterations, each one. So there's a reasonable amount of data out there. You could always like more, but that was. Uh, so what are some of the issues? Now, there's a lot of actual 
tricks involving experimentation, which I had no, no clue about to start with. Um, the first thing is, of course, you have to have the right facility and you've got to be able to recruit people from a pool. and all. That was all taken care of by the fact that we have this nice behavioral science lab in the business school that Valerie and other people are running. Um, we then, you have to get people to take the, quest, the task seriously. I mean, the undergraduate pool, they come in, you're paying them of the order of $20 for an hour's work. It's very tempting probably for them just to look at their phone all the time and just keep pressing something like that. Uh, so we had to make sure, try to induce um, them to reveal their, their beliefs in some way. We did that by giving you more money if you got the correct answer. And to make sure you paid attention all the time, we paid them on a randomly chosen iteration rather than just the last one, in which case they fall asleep for nine iterations and then take it seriously. In order to do that, you've got to be a bit careful. You also don't want them just to put don't know every time because it's too hard to think about. So we tried to incentivize it so that you get more for being correct. Your expected payoff if you put don't know is better than randomly guessing the other answers, but it's still not nearly as good as thinking about the answer. So who knows whether the utility functions of the, uh, of the participants were sufficiently stimulated by those payments, but we, that's all we could do, really. And that's a big problem in all these experiments. Here's an idea of the questions. Uh, there's a set of three questions in psychology that are called the cognitive reflection test of Frederick. Um, and, of course, you know, to an audience like this, they all look pretty easy, but apparently they're quite hard. Uh, so uh, that was the first one. Five machines, five minutes, five widgets. How long does it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? And we just said, is it more or less than 50? That was what you had to choose. Right. Uh, this is a slightly more complicated one to state. It's not that hard. If I'd had a picture, it would have been easier. You have uh, four cards. This is a very old one. It's been used in like hundreds of papers because it's considered to be very difficult. Something like a quarter of the population can get this right given a reasonable length of time to think about. It's because conditional, conditional uh, lo you know, logic of implication seems to be difficult for a lot of people. So you've got four cards. You have a logical proposition that you claimed you have to test whether it's true or false and uh, which cards do you need to turn over. Okay. So those are the two of the questions. Those are what we call, I suppose, the analytical questions. Uh, we also had three factual questions. One of them was uh, this one, sort of supposed to be aimed to some extent at the target audience a little bit. Um, here's uh, one of these urban myth type of things, which we thought we'd put in there. People might have heard of it. And uh, this one, of course, was designed to be impossible to do. Right? So we tried to induce people without telling them directly to think a bit about what other people might know. At least that was our, our idea. It was well, hopefully that subjects would think about the, the beliefs of others and realize that in this case it would be ridiculous for anyone to even make a guess. For this last one, because it was so ridiculous, we gave the answer privately to a couple of people and we told all the rest of them that we have given it. We have given it to them privately. Right. So um, we expect probably some different uh, behavior on these different questions. So just as a note, this Wason test turned out um, to be difficult. So even though they are all uh, past university entrance somehow, <laughs> they still found it difficult. Um, they had something like two minutes to answer the first time and then they had 30 seconds each iteration to update which now that we've seen, a f well, not many other papers in the area, but it actually seems reasonably generous, that amount of time. But uh, more than, oh, you'll see the graphs in a minute. But anyway, it was consistent with the psychology literature that it was a hard one. We thought this fast and furious question, most likely you either know it or you don't, and you would know that you didn't know it, and you would guess very strongly that other people in the room, since they all look a bit like you, some of them would know it. That was our, our belief, but we, we weren't sure. And we made this impossible question, right, as we said. So what are the key findings? First one, crowd's not always wise, right? So not a surprise, probably, but um, aggregate information, correct information was not always aggregated 
by the group, even in 10 iterations. I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, I think one of the key things that is interesting is that there are very different, there seem to be quite different behavior between different types of questions. I'm not going to um, present very many graphs and things here. We, we have a preprint that we're almost finished with vast amounts of analysis in there, and there's still a lot more that could be done. Uh, but it seems to be a bit of a difference between these analytical ones where you can work it out yourself without any influence from anybody in principle and factual type questions where you know that you have no idea possibly about this piece of information. And I guess we're, one of the findings we have is that anyone, if you're trying to model this diffusion of beliefs, you really need to take that into account, the type of question you're talking about. There's a clear asymmetry between don't know and the other answers. Now, one speculation we have is that if you forced people to choose one or the other and didn't allow the don't know, you would get probably worse results in terms of aggregation of the right result. Uh, but we haven't yet done that control experiment, so we need a bit more money before we can do that one. Uh, but even so, in, in the complete model we have, where we're forcing people to choose between three and we're allowing them the don't know, there's a clear asymmetry between them. It's not that hard to to guess why that is, but I'll show you that in a minute. And we found that there seemed to be three groups of subjects. I don't think we expected this. So there is, we looked at all the times where people change their belief, their uh, answer, and there seem to be uh, people who require almost no influence from anyone in order to change, some who essentially never change until everyone is against them, right? And those that seem to adopt this majority dynamics. And it's kind of a clear distinct groups of, of subjects there. And of course, in any social science experiment, we found that rationality was violated, right? If you think about that last question, you know that some people have been given the answer, and you're pretty sure that everyone else, everyone else knows they haven't been given the answer, plus it's essentially impossible to guess. They should all write, put don't know until they get the signal from one of their neighbors of the correct answer, and they should just copy that. But of course they didn't. Some people put the wrong answer down right, right from the start. So you get some sort of behavior like that. Here's the correctness. So this is, gives you an idea of um, what we mean. The second question, so that the, the rows are the um, particular four different time experiments we had on different days. And these are the questions, the five questions. And you can see this Wason test, um, it was below 50% or no more than 50% on the first iteration. And here it went, it was worse at the end than it was at the beginning. So that's, you know, clearly not very wise, the crowd there. And here, when the, in the complete graph, they just immediately went, realized that a large majority of people uh, had the wrong, that had one answer, and they just went with that, right? There was no reason to change, which is it's a little disturbing. Um, this is the one with the widgets question, you know, you make this many in this five and five minutes with five workers, etc. And it's a bit variable, but at least overall they, well here it was a bit strange. Overall, at least the majority opinion was basically right by the end. And here, of course, much better. As you'd expect, this is the one with the black and white dots. All they had to do was wait, right? And they should be able to get the right answer. This Great Wall of China thing is a little bit confusing. Sort of in between, hard to know exactly what was going on there yet. This, I think, is, gives you a better idea of what's going on. This is the answer type frequency. So black means you didn't answer at all for whatever reason, fell asleep, whatever. R red means you got it right. These are the five different questions aggregated over the four different experiments. Red means you got it right. Green is don't know, and blue is wrong. And you can see the Wason thing, a lot of people were wrong. But you can also see not that many people were undecided there. That was the thing that surprised Surprising in a way, but not, you know, since it's an analytical question, you know that you can do it. It's just amazing how few people could do it. But here, there's a lot more people waiting, saying don't know. This, that's the complete, the right behavior, you would think, and, and here as well. You'd expect a lot of people just to sit there and wait until they get the correct signal from those who do know. So there's a bit of a difference there. Um, the don't know is very asymmetric. So this is the this is the empirical cumulative distribution function. So here is the um, fraction of people of neighbors who were your color, and here is the probability of 
um, switching oh, to that color. And so when you're red, some people will switch to red with not very many neighbors who are red. And then there's a whole honk, a fair amount of them who jump around the point where 50% of their neighbors are red. And then there's some who hold out to here. Green is similar, but the key thing is the yellow is very different. Because in order to become undecided, it's not, ne not necessary that you have a lot of undecided neighbors. You just have to have conflicting evidence, one would imagine, right, from different sides. So you're more likely to, and here there's a lot of people who are undecided early on and it continued like that. So that's an interesting feature. Um, there's not, we couldn't find very much, there's a huge literature of course in, in social network diffusion stuff, but in this particular area we couldn't find much. We just found this one um, like last week, I think, after we've done all this stuff. It's quite similar in some ways. They have a they had three questions here from the cognitive reflection test, but they allowed free-form answers. They didn't have uh, multiple choice answers, uh, which, and this is the correctness. This is how many of them, uh, these are the, the, the ranges over the different experiments. So, and they use different topologies. So here they had, they had several different networks. And you can see here the question one, which probably it was one of those I can't remember the, the one we had with the widgets. I don't know whether it was the first, second, or third, but it's one of their three. Yeah. They have this set up. Uh, this, you can see here that uh, as the time, they only had five trials and instead of ten, five iterations each time. But you can see that there's some sort of aggregation of information going on there. But um, it was a little bit weird, I thought, what they were doing because uh, they had a free-form answer, and so it's quite possible that uh, there's the. It's quite possible that most people were wrong, but they all had different wrong answers, and so the correct answer was the plurality winner, <laughs> it's the most likely one, and so that would get people copying it possibly, uh, just almost out by luck. I'm not quite sure. So there's a few things to look at there, but that, that is actually the most similar thing to uh, our work that we've seen. Future work, um, let me just go to, just mention a couple of things. We haven't so investigated yet anything to do with the subjects, the particular people. Each of them we can go through and see that some of them will have changed more often than others. We can try to, uh, in terms of these basic threshold models where you switch your, based on, uh, if, if you get more than say 60% of people uh, saying green, then you turn green, all right? And that 60% number is a property of you, uh, possibly of the type of question that you have. W we could do that kind of, uh, we could get bounds from the observed data. We might be able to do some kind of statistical analysis. I think there's not enough data to really get into it in as much detail as we would like. And any model, in fact, you'd try and fit, there's always going to be an issue there. However, we did find that as far as we can work out, our results are not inconsistent with the original model that we started with and therefore at least it's worth um, worth studying that. So we, we reassured ourselves a bit on that. We haven't investigated the role of the topology in detail. We only had two very different ones and we haven't really investigated in the case where the graph is very different. So you've got some nodes with very high and very low degree. You could see whether there's a difference there. Etc. We've got all the data. We could dig into all of this if we felt like it. Um, haven't got there yet. So um, I've got a question for the audience: Is, is um, can we do it more cheaply? Because you know these undergraduates are expensive. I don't know. You know, it's it's our budget is uh, in the sort of low <laughs> thousands, right? <laughs> very low, and so you don't get very many data points uh, that way. And I uh, think I'll leave it at that. Close. <laughs> now, any questions of anything detailed you asked uh, directly to Valerie? He's not here today. Oh, he's not here. Questions from Mark for Valerie. Thank you. 
period, if there might be some people who are switching back and forth, I see my neighbors switch, mm -hmm. and now, then I shouldn't really trust them. I, I realize that if they, don't, they don't really know the answer, right? So mm -hmm. I, maybe I pay more attention. If I'm sitting here and some, several of my neighbors are blinking on, on and off, and the other ones are, are just staying at the same mm -hmm. answer, then maybe I trust the ones. Who yeah, we didn't, we didn't tell them uh, which neighbor was doing what. We just said you have seven neighbors, three of them said this, four, two of them said that, and two of them were undecided. And we didn't tell, they can't see the, they can't the, see the series of, of is that so then it starts to get really, I mean, interesting, but yeah. Then you could start thinking about letting them choose their own network, who they follow, and stuff like that. But no, here we forced them to. They, so they didn't know anything other than they're in a room with a whole lot of people that look like them, and they're connected to some of them. Presumably they could have worked out um, in the complete graph when it said, you know, you had 29 neighbors, or whatever, they probably could work out that that's the whole room. Apart from that. Have you observed something like attention behavior, right? Like who are the strategic behavior? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the wrong answer, but then in the last one, I was going to do the correct one. We haven't looked for it. I don't think we would like, be likely to find it because. I mean, you have to have very strange. You don't know who the people are that you are, um, you know, uh, annoying by doing that, and you're the, you're going to potentially lose money because you're getting paid for random iterations. You don't know whether that's the one. That, so I mean, we, I, I find it hard to believe that would be a big problem, but I suppose we could look for it. Sure that they did it. <laughs> that would be a good start. Yeah. yeah. So that, that can be done. Yeah. You can check all of that. Um, yeah. Just just want to just going back to this uh, one thing I forgot to say here. One of the fun, that their big picture finding here was that uh, the group gets smarter, but the individuals don't get any smarter. Because so they. Not surprising because they only gave them 15 seconds for each iteration and the whole experiment was an hour, but the two competing theories is that one is that by getting feedback uh, from your neighbors saying your answer might be wrong, it stimulates you to think better, and the other one is that it just stimulates you to copy them. And their finding was that they're pretty sure that it's, it's mostly due to copying, which is not surprising and you don't really have enough time to, to, to think about it again. Um, so that's it's good though, because then it doesn't really matter what order you ask the questions in, it seems. So there are, there's always potentially problematic issues like that seem to go away. Um, at least we're fairly happy that they're not a major problem. In this case, where they had the three, four answers, were the, were the neighbors given the answers, or were, were they just given the same statistic that you were? Because if you're given an answer, you can check it, right? It's, it's good. Yeah. Just I have to check. I mean, like all of these papers, it's like a seven-page glitzy thing and thirty-page appendix, and you, you dive, you dive into that, and you click on their spreadsheet, and you see that, yeah, the, actually the data they make available, there's some missing data that they really should have kept if you want to reproduce the experiment properly. They didn't put that in there, but uh, overall, it's not bad. But yeah, I, I can't remember whether they did that. I suspect they just said. Uh, they, they, all the they, they would have to show the answers, otherwise it would be hard to herd on the same thing. Yeah, but you, they only gave them much less time than we did. I mean, 15 seconds is quite hard to check uh, on some of those problems, right? But you're, you're right, yeah. It's, it's extra information. Yeah, there's a lot more information getting fed back in that group, yeah. So, so there's six, um, you can imagine if you, if you felt marked, if you were risk neutral, you yeah. think you're more likely to be right than wrong, yeah. then six isn't really enough to no. push you towards no answer, right? So you might want, it might be interesting to see whether there, you get a lot more undecideds if you push yeah. seven or eight. I mean, there's just so many knobs you can twiddle on yeah. this machine, right? So we could do the whole thing again with totally different topologies, or as you say, change that. I mean, you could, it would be really nice if you could get each subject and have a work out somehow the utility, or at least by some pretest and <laughs> pay them in such a way to incentivize them to, to do that. But yeah, that would be interesting. Of course, if you put it too high, then yeah, no one's going to bother answering. Um, yeah.
Yeah, very hard to work out where to put that number. Yeah, well, it's not clear where, whether it was in the middle. It's just that it randomly chose the duration. So the idea was we wanted them to say, for all you know, this is the last iteration that counts. So make it count and do whatever you think is going to give you the best payoff. That's what we're hoping they would do. I mean, who knows how many people do that? Well, if you want to be right at the end, um, why look at any of the other rounds except the ninth one? I mean, if you're looking at other people, you can't trust what other people are doing. They could all be just waiting till the last round. Well, I think, from the point of view of conserving energy and getting back, you could just not do anything until the last iteration. That was what we thought would happen if um, if we didn't do that. Um, and I'll, I'll just, it's certainly true that whatever you do in terms of the payoff scheme can potentially influence the behavior quite a bit. That's what makes it so tricky. I'm hoping that it would be nice to be able to do this on a much larger scale in some way. Um, well, you suggested one thing. Yeah, that's a possibility, but yeah. Real large scale internet experiments, I'm not, yeah. The leafs, I mean, it's really hard to say anything about them. In the end, it's observ observation. Because nobody gets to talk to the, anyone else about the beliefs and convince each other or anything. It's just uh, they're observing their answers. So the, even the participants are not necessarily thinking that hard about it. So um, the reason we chose 10 was purely just for practical purposes, right? If we keep them longer, too long, then we have to pay them more. Um, these guys only use five iterations in their experiment. It seems to be reasonably a reasonable number. But yeah, I think you're... It could be... I mean, I don't know. Uh, you look at these things. These are just the aggregate. We're not looking at each individual. These are just the statistics of the whole group. Um, so question... Some of those questions you can see, yeah, maybe it hadn't completely converged. Although I'd be surprised if it looked much different if we ran it for 10 more. Then you've got the whole boredom issue as well. Taking pe getting people to take it seriously. If you do too many iterations, I'm just going to do this. Yeah, well, there's disentangling time for further thoughts and the inference of well, inferences they draw from other actions as mm -hmm. well. So I'm saying there's a possibility that if you uh, waste on for a hundred periods, yeah. some start to think, hang on, why is this stubborn minority of people who persist in Yeah, we it's not too obvious that it would stay like that forever, but we'll always not. Now I don't know what this is going to get applied to, if anything, eventually, right? So who knows how whether a hundred iterations or ten is more realistic in terms of uh, you know, whatever potential application you may have. I don't know. But yeah, it would be nice to do that, but again it's a resource issue, right? 